Knowledge Products presents Audio Classics, the Declaration of Independence by Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson still survives. These were the last words of John Adams. Adams died in 1826 on the 4th of July. John Adams didn't know it, but Thomas Jefferson had already died five hours earlier. An 83-year-old Jefferson had awakened during the night. Is it the 4th? he asked. Yes, he was told. Jefferson went back to sleep and quietly passed away. John Adams was the second president of the United States and an architect of American independence. Thomas Jefferson was the third president of the United States and author of the Declaration of Independence. The nearly simultaneous deaths of Adams and Jefferson made this an extraordinary Fourth of July, but additional details made it even more significant. July 4th, 1826 was the 50th anniversary of American independence. Ten days before his death, Thomas Jefferson was invited to attend festivities in Washington, D.C. His response, declining because of illness, was his last letter. It contains Jefferson's final thoughts on the Declaration of Independence. May it be to the world what I believe it will be, to some parts sooner, to others later, but finally to all, the signal of arousing men to burst the chains under which monkish ignorance and superstition had persuaded them to bind themselves and to assume the blessings and security of self-government. That form which we have substituted restores the free right to the unbounded exercise of reason and freedom of opinion. All eyes are opened or opening to the rights of man. The general spread of the light of science has already laid open to every view the palpable truth that the mass of mankind has not been born with saddles on their backs, nor a favored few booted and spurred ready to ride them legitimately by the grace of God. These are the grounds of hope for others. For ourselves, let the annual return of this day forever refresh our recollections of these rites and an undiminished devotion to them. Although the Declaration of Independence is quite brief, it is packed with philosophy and history. The Declaration has cast its spell over generations of Americans, not primarily because of its relation to independence, but because of its philosophical value. It captures the thinking of an age, of a country, with a concise elegance which has rarely, if ever, been surpassed in American letters. The Declaration was written by the right man. Thomas Jefferson, in the right place, colonial America, at the right time, during a revolutionary war. Change any of these conditions, and the declaration we know would not exist. Its replacement would surely pale by comparison. This presentation explores the historical and philosophical background of the declaration. It is divided into three sections. The first part clarifies some commonly misunderstood features of the Declaration and ends with a reading of the entire text. The second part traces the early life of Thomas Jefferson, examines how he came to write the Declaration, and offers some examples of how the Declaration as Jefferson wrote it differs from the Declaration we know today. The third and final part explores the philosophy of the Declaration, especially its defense of the right of revolution against an oppressive government. Most significant events in human history are plagued by differences of interpretation. The Declaration is no exception. Historians argue among themselves over vital points, and it is doubtful whether these controversies will ever be settled to everyone's satisfaction. To minimize the problems of interpretation, we have allowed participants to speak for themselves wherever possible. The Declaration was not a piece of old parchment to these founding fathers. It was literally an issue of life and death. The signers of the Declaration knew they faced charges of treason, punishable by death, if they lost the war with England. When these signers pledged their lives, fortunes, and sacred honor to the cause of American independence, they were doing far more than paying lip service to a noble sentiment. <laughs> In 
It may surprise you to learn that there is no document actually entitled the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson wrote the original rough draft, and he called it a Declaration of the Representatives of the United States of America in General Congress Assembled. After being edited in committee, Jefferson's draft was debated and edited by the Continental Congress on July 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. The edited document was formally adopted on July 4th, 1776. Congress later ordered the declaration to be engrossed on parchment. This version, signed on August 2nd, carries the title The Unanimous Declaration of the Thirteen United States of America. Most reprints of the declaration are based on the parchment copy. Strictly speaking, the so-called Declaration of Independence did not declare independence. Rather, it stated the reasons and justifications for a formal separation from Britain, which had already occurred. On June 7, 1776, Richard Henry Lee, a delegate from Virginia, rose in the Continental Congress and made the following resolution. Resolved that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. Lee's resolution, a formal declaration of independence, was passed on July 2nd, 1776. This was the day that John Adams, writing to his wife Abigail, predicted would become a day of celebration for Americans. The second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable epic in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other, from this time forward forevermore. If independence was declared on July 2nd, why do Americans commemorate independence on July 4th? The edited version of Jefferson's Declaration was adopted on this day. This much historians agree on. But the 4th of July is also believed by many Americans to be the day on which the Declaration was first signed by delegates to the Continental Congress. Here we fall into murky controversy where historians disagree. Many historians reject a 4th of July signing, relegating this story to one of the myths of American history. The only signing by delegates, they say, took place on August 2nd, when the parchment version was signed. So, who said the Declaration was signed on the 4th of July? Thomas Jefferson, for one. In later life, Jefferson recalled a 4th of July signing, and he produced as evidence notes which he said were written virtually as the events occurred. John Adams also recalled a signing on July 4th. The testimony of these eyewitnesses might seem conclusive, were it not for some troublesome details. No congressional record mentions this signing. No signed copy dated on the 4th has ever been found. And no contemporary letters from other delegates mention this signing. These are some reasons why historians question the account of Jefferson and Adams, dismissing it as the faulty recollections of two old men. The possibility of a July 4th signing was rehabilitated by the distinguished scholar Julian Boyd, editor of the massive Princeton edition of the papers of Thomas Jefferson. Professor Boyd evaluated the various arguments against a 4th of July signing and found them either faulty or inconclusive. It appears the jury deciding this controversy may remain out indefinitely. In reading the Declaration, we shall divide it into five parts. The first part articulates the obligation felt by congressional delegates to justify their separation from Britain. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. The second part summarizes the moral and political ideas used to justify independence and the American Revolution. This elegant summary is the most important part of the Declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, 
that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer, while evils are sufferable, than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. The third part of the Declaration is the longest by far. It lists colonial grievances against George III, King of Great Britain. The real significance here lies not in the accusations themselves, but in their target. They are aimed at the English King instead of at the English Parliament. Why is this important? Because according to the political theory of the Declaration, severing ties with the mother country was warranted only if the King defaulted on the obligation to protect his subjects. The Declaration says of the King, he has refused his assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained, and when so suspended he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them, and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers, incapable of annihilation, have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states, for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migration hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us, in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislature. He has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, 
for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments, for suspending our own legislatures, and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coast, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. The fourth part of the Declaration expresses disappointment in the failure of the English people to support the American cause. Nor have we been wanting in attention to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They, too, have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must, therefore, acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them, as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. The fifth and final part of the Declaration asserts the political sovereignty of the United States of America. Notice how it incorporates Richard Henry Lee's Resolution for Independence, which we quoted earlier. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of the Declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. By dividing the Declaration into five parts, we can see how it progresses step by step. The first part states the reason for writing a Declaration. The second part summarizes the philosophy behind the Declaration. And the third part mounts an offensive against George III by citing the accumulated grievances of many years. With its theoretical and factual case complete at this point, the Declaration winds down to its conclusion. The fourth part expresses regret that Americans have not been supported by their English cousins. And the fifth part asserts the political sovereignty of the United States. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson was born in 1743 in Goochland, or what is now known as Albemarle County, Virginia. 
His father, a surveyor and explorer, married into the wealthy Randolph family and left Jefferson a large inheritance in land and slaves. When Jefferson married Martha Skelton in 1772, her dowry consisted of thousands of acres of land and over 130 slaves. By the time Jefferson wrote the Declaration, he was one of Virginia's wealthiest citizens and a major slaveholder. It is jarring to realize that the author of the Declaration of Independence, a magnificent tribute to individual liberty, was also hip deep in slaveholding, the repudiation of all that liberty stands for. This inconsistency, some would call it hypocrisy, was not lost on Jefferson or on the many other founding fathers, such as George Washington, who also owned slaves. Fully one-third of the signers of the Declaration were slave owners. An anti-slavery Quaker took a well-deserved swipe at this state of affairs. When men talk of liberty, they mean their own liberty, and seldom suffer their thoughts on that part to stray to their neighbor. It is an irony of history that Jefferson, a major participant in slaveholding, was a virulent critic of slavery, calling it a hideous evil and calling for its eventual abolition. But Jefferson also believed that America would suffer upheaval if thousands of slaves were released into American society. We have a wolf by the ears, and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go. Justice is in one scale and self-preservation in the other. A defender of Jefferson might point out that the manumission or liberating of slaves was illegal in Jefferson's time, and that Jefferson did try to legalize manumission when he served in the Virginia legislature. In addition, after writing the Declaration, Jefferson drafted a constitution for Virginia in which he called for the gradual eradication of slavery in his native state. A critic of Jefferson, however, might point out that Jefferson did not hesitate to advertise for the recapture of a runaway slave, and that his magnificent estate at Monticello, a work of many years, was built with the labor of slaves. Ultimately, there is little we can do to erase the blemish of slaveholding from the record of Thomas Jefferson. We must live with it, as we hope Jefferson did, uncomfortably. After graduating from the College of William and Mary in 1762, Jefferson studied law and was admitted to the bar in 1767. His interests, like his reading, were varied and intense. Jefferson's keen mind traversed over philosophy, law, architecture, history, music. The list is quite astonishing. Perhaps more than any other American of his day, Thomas Jefferson was a model of the 18th century Enlightenment. Jefferson served in the Virginia legislature for six years, beginning in 1769. In 1774, he wrote a summary view of the rights of British America, which proved to be second in importance only to the Declaration among his political writings. This pamphlet is useful in understanding the evolution of Jefferson's ideas. By 1774, many Americans supported resistance to parliamentary measures they considered unjust, but few Americans, especially in Virginia, denied outright the authority of the English Parliament to rule over America. Jefferson was among those few. One free and independent legislature hereby takes upon itself to suspend the powers of another, free and independent as itself, thus exhibiting a phenomenon, unknown in nature, the creator and creature of its own power. Not only the principles of common sense, but the common feelings of human nature must be surrendered up before His Majesty's subjects here can be persuaded to believe that they hold their political existence at the will of a British Parliament. Shall these governments be dissolved, their property annihilated, and their people reduced to a state of nature at the imperious breath of a body of men whom they never saw, in whom they never confided, and over whom they have no powers of punishment or removal, let their crimes against the American public be ever so great? Can any one reason be assigned why 160,000 electors in the island of Great Britain should give law to four millions in the states of America, every individual of whom is equal to every individual of them in virtue, in understanding, and in bodily strength? Were this to be admitted, instead of being a free people, as we have hitherto supposed and mean to continue ourselves, we should suddenly be found the slaves not of one, but of 160,000 tyrants, distinguished too from all others by this singular circumstance, that they are removed from the reach of fear, the only restraining motive which may hold the hand of a tyrant. 
This early pamphlet by Jefferson advances the theory that Americans owe allegiance to the king, not to the parliament. America and England stand as independent bodies under the authority of George III. This is one reason why Jefferson did not concern himself in the Declaration with allegations against Parliament. America, he believed, was and always had been independent of Parliament. True independence meant renouncing allegiance to the king. Crucial arguments in a summary view re-emerge in the Declaration, sometimes with similar wording. Especially important are its allegations against George III, which closely resemble the Declaration. In 1775, Thomas Jefferson was sent by the Virginia Convention to the Second Continental Congress meeting in Philadelphia. After Richard Henry Lee presented the Resolution for Independence, Congress appointed a committee of five to draft a declaration. The committee members represented various sections of the country. Thomas Jefferson was from the South. John Adams and Roger Sherman were from New England. Benjamin Franklin and Robert Livingston, an opponent of independence, were from the middle colonies. It was logical that Jefferson would be the penman of the Declaration. He received the most votes to sit on the committee, and, since a Virginian made the resolution for independence, it was considered appropriate that a Virginian should write it. John Adams approached Thomas Jefferson to write the Declaration. Both men wrote accounts of this historic meeting many years after the event, and not surprisingly, the accounts do not entirely agree. Here is what John Adams had to say. Mr. Jefferson came into Congress in June 1775 and brought with him a reputation for literature, science, and a happy talent of composition. Writings of his were handed about, remarkable for the peculiar felicity of expression. Though a silent member in Congress, he was so prompt, frank, explicit, and decisive upon committees and in conversation, not even Samuel Adams was more so, that he soon seized upon my heart. And upon this occasion, I gave him my vote and did all in my power to procure the votes of others. I think he had one more vote than any other, and that placed him at the head of the committee. I had the next highest number, and that placed me the second. The committee met, discussed the subject, and they appointed Mr. Jefferson and me to make the draft. I suppose because we were the first two on the list. The subcommittee met. Jefferson proposed to me to make the draft. I said, I will not. You should do it. Oh, no. Why will you not? You ought to do it. I will not. Why? Reason enough. What can be your reasons? Reason first. You are a Virginian, and a Virginian ought to appear at the head of this business. Reason second. I am obnoxious, suspected, and unpopular. You are very much otherwise. Reason third. You can write ten times better than I can. Well, said Jefferson, if you are decided, I will do as well as I can. A meeting we accordingly had and conned the paper over. I was delighted with its high tone and the flights of oratory with which it abounded, especially that concerning Negro slavery, which, though I knew his southern brethren would never suffer to pass in Congress, I certainly never would oppose. There were other expressions which I would not have inserted if I had drawn it up, particularly that which called the king tyrant. I thought this too personal, for I never believed George to be a tyrant in disposition and in nature. I always believed him to be deceived by his courtiers on both sides of the Atlantic, and in his official capacity only cruel. I thought the expression too passionate and too much like scolding for so grave and solemn a document. But as Franklin and Sherman were to inspect it afterwards, I thought it would not become me to strike it out. I consented to report it, and do not now remember that I made or suggested a single alteration. We reported it to the Committee of Five. It was read, and I do not remember that Franklin or Sherman criticized anything. We were all in haste, Congress was impatient, and the instrument was reported, as I believe, in Jefferson's handwriting as he first drew it. Congress cut off about a quarter of it, as I expected they would, but they obliterated some of the best of it and left all that was exceptionable, if anything in it was. There is not an idea in it but what had been hackneyed in Congress for two years before. The substance of it is contained in the Declaration of Rights and the violation of those rights in the journals of Congress in 1774. Indeed, the essence of it is contained in a pamphlet voted and printed by the town of Boston before the first Congress met, composed by James Otis, as I suppose in one of his lucid intervals, and pruned and polished by Samuel Adams. 
Thomas Jefferson, not pleased with the recollections of John Adams, had this to say. The committee of five met. No such thing as a subcommittee was proposed, but they unanimously pressed on myself alone to undertake the draft. I consented. I drew it. But before I reported it to the committee, I communicated it separately to Dr. Franklin and Mr. Adams, requesting their corrections because they were the two members of whose judgments and amendments I wished most to have the benefit before presenting it to the committee. Their alterations were two or three only, and merely verbal. I then wrote a fair copy, reported it to the committee, and from them, unaltered, to Congress. This personal communication and consultation with Mr. Adams he has misremembered into the actings of a subcommittee. Pickering's observations, and Mr. Adams' in addition, that it contained no new ideas, that it is a commonplace compilation, its sentiments hackneyed in Congress for two years before, and its essence contained in Otis's pamphlet, may all be true. Of that I am not to be the judge. Richard Henry Lee charged it as copied from Locke's treatise on government. Otis' pamphlet I never saw, and whether I had gathered my ideas from reading or reflection I do not know. I only know that I turned to neither book nor pamphlet while writing it. I did not consider it as any part of my charge to invent new ideas altogether and to offer no sentiment which had ever been expressed before. Whether also the sentiments of independence and the reasons for declaring it which make so great a portion of the instrument had been hackneyed in Congress for two years before the 4th of July, 76, or this dictum also of Mr. Adams be another slip of memory, let history say. After Jefferson wrote the rough draft, he, along with Adams and Franklin, made some revisions. The Declaration then moved to the floor of Congress for debate, during which additional revisions and substantial deletions were made. All in all, Jefferson's Declaration was subjected to 86 alterations. It also saw a quarter of its text excised by Congress. Among the revisions of Jefferson's original rough draft, the most interesting occurred in this famous line. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Here is how Jefferson originally wrote this line. We hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable, that all men are created equal and independent, that from that equal creation they derive rights inherent and inalienable, among which are the preservation of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. The most substantial deletion by Congress was of Jefferson's polemic blaming George III for the slave trade in America. Here is the passage that never made it into the declaration we know today. He has waged cruel war against human nature itself violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. This piratical warfare, the opprobrium of infidel powers, is the warfare of the Christian king of Great Britain. Determined to keep open a market where men should be bought and sold, he has prostituted his negative for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or to restrain this execrable commerce, and that this assemblage of horrors might want no fact of distinguished die, he is now exciting those very people to rise up in arms among us and to purchase that liberty of which he has deprived them by murdering the people upon whom he also obtruded them thus paying off former crimes committed against the liberties of one people with crimes which he urges them to commit against the lives of another. The deletion of this passage on the slave trade angered Jefferson, and he was displeased by some other alterations as well. As the 33-year-old Jefferson simmered, watching Congress cut and paste his treasured document, Benjamin Franklin, elder statesman of the Continental Congress, tried to console his colleague with his story. I have made it a rule whenever in my power to avoid becoming a draftsman of papers to be reviewed by a public body. I took my lesson from an incident which I will relate to you. When I was a journeyman printer, one of my companions, an apprentice hatter, having served out his time, was about to open shop for himself. His first concern was to have a handsome signboard with a proper inscription. 
he composed it in these words. John Thompson, hatter, makes and sells hats for ready money, with a figure of a hat subjoined. But he thought he would submit it to his friends for their amendments. The first he showed it to thought the word hatter tautologous, because followed by the words makes hats, which show he was a hatter, it was struck out. The next observed that the word makes might as well be omitted, because the customers would not care who made the hats. If good, and to their mind, they would buy by whomever made. He struck it out. A third said he thought the words for ready money were useless, as it was not the custom of the place to sell on credit. Everyone who purchased expected to pay. They were parted with, and the inscription now stood, John Thompson sells hats. Sells hats, says his next friend. Why, nobody will expect you to give them away. What then is the use of that word? It was stricken out, the rather as there was one painted on the board. So his inscription was reduced ultimately to John Thompson, with the figure of a hat subjoined. Thus did a seasoned politician named Ben Franklin soothe the ruffled feelings of a young and sensitive author named Thomas Jefferson. This is the end of Side 1. Please turn over this tape and begin Side 2.